Hey, welcome everybody back to another episode of the Nonprofit Show. We're really excited that you're here because we have a fascinating discussion. Mitch Stein and I are really excited to bring in Catherine Alonzo from Havelina Consulting, talking about the power of nonprofit branding. Okay, Catherine, when I first met you, I have this really strong sense of what a Havelina is and what they do. How did you get that name and align that to your company? What a fantastic question. So we, when we first started our company, there were three founding partners and we spent a lot of time trying to arrange our last names into some sort of company name. And we found, we tried every name that we could think of that had consulting or public affairs in it. And just nothing was good. Nothing was leaping off the page at us. And so we thought, you know what, we're going to go a completely different direction and we are going to pick an evocative name that is representative of who we are and what we do for our clients. And so the thing about javelinas, the animal, is that they are Southwestern, they're indigenous to Arizona, and also they are, they're assertive. People will always tell me, oh, I have javelinas in my neighborhood and they're nasty things. I'm like, well, they're assertive, they're creative, and then most importantly, javelinas do everything in community. They eat in community, they move in community, they wash in packs. And that's really, really a great representation of the clients that we work with, the nonprofits, the businesses, the political campaigns that we work with are all not only grounded in their community, but really driven to make change on the local level. And so that's why it was the perfect name for us. Wow. Okay. And and I've learned something today because I never have heard of a javelina before as the one not from Arizona. <laughs> well, so that was the tricky thing that when we started the company, I don't think it I don't think we ever really thought about the fact that nobody outside of Arizona knows what a javelina is and everybody pronounces it javelina. <laughs> and now we work across the country. And quite often when I'm introduced to new clients or new potential clients, and they say, you know is your company Javelin A? <laughs> and I have to explain what a Javelina is. And so one of my like personal what a- missions would be that everyone in the country knows what a Javelina is because of the work we're able to do. Well, that's a great starting point, a great kickoff conversation. So that's so cool. And, you know, as Julie mentioned, I'm one of the co-hosts here. We actually have a full panel of amazing co-hosts that will host with each other or with Julia. Um, so I'm excited to join today. I'm the head of strategy at Chariot. We are a donorized, donor advised fund fundraising solution for nonprofits. Uh, so happy to chat with anyone more about that. But uh, I'm also very passionate about marketing and brand. And so I'm incredibly excited about today's conversation. Well, and we, can, we are thrilled that you're here because I know, Mitch, you know a lot about this. And so you're the perfect co-host for today. So thank you. Of course. And we want to be sure to recognize all of our amazing sponsors before we get going. Those include Bloomerang, American Nonprofit Academy, uh, the Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy, 180 Management Group, your part-time controller, Staffing Boutique, Inc., JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Thank you all for your support. Awesome. Really an amazing group. And for those of you wondering what a javelina actually looks like, um, for for living us living in the West, they strike fear in our hearts because they are crazy fast and they're like a giant pig. And you see them, you're like, "What the heck is that?" And they can f- turn on a dime. They are super nimble. They don't look like they would be, and they can be aggressive. Um, they're they're a fascinating pack uh, structure. And so, Catherine Alonzo. As a CEO and founding partner, I love that you came up with Havelina Consulting. I think it's really interesting. And uh, Mitch, I got to say, you're a total Eastern city boy. We got to get you out to the West so you can see one of these beasts. I would love to. I also, when I looked up Havelina, there's a Mexican restaurant in New York City called Havelina. <laughs> there you go. So I'll also have to check that out. I love it. Well, it is a really fascinating thing. And um, it, it's really a wonderful way to launch into this conversation, uh, Catherine Alonzo, because we got to start off with this. I think everybody's going to have a different answer, but what is a brand and what is it not? What should we be looking at here? 
So when we do our fantastic work with our nonprofit clients that are trying to make change the world, the point that we that we really drive home is that your brand is like your organization's personality. So just like a human being has a rich and full personality that lives in certainly kind of how they look, but also the behaviors that they make and how they act and what they care about and their hobbies and their interests. An organization's brand is just as multidimensional and as rich as that. And what your brand isn't is your logo. <laughs> that a lot of people use the name, the word brand interchangeably when they're talking about logo or color palette. And really your brand is way richer and far more robust than that. Mm -hmm. You know, Mitch, I'm thinking about the number of nonprofits that I talk with and they get bored of their own brand. And so they think, well, yeah. we, you know, things aren't going well. We're not doing great fundraising. We need to change our brand. And they, they, they get misguided about this whole thing. And I'm wondering, have you ever experienced that? Yeah. I, I think for a lot of organizations in the nonprofit space, they've been around for a long time. So their imagery probably does feel a little outdated. And that's, like you said, things like logo and design elements, there are a part of brand, but they are not all of brand. And I certainly have seen folks um, go the, the wrong direction where they've done this change around their logo or their color palette and their visuals, which maybe was needed, but it's important to start with the kind of work that you're talking about, about identity and messaging and yeah i would love to hear a little bit more about that that being the wrong example i've seen what does it look like when someone goes about it the right way well i'm so glad that you mentioned messaging mitch because i think that that is often a really important part of branding that's overlooked and to the example you get julia quite often organizations know that there's something that's not working in their organization's brand and so they think let's update the logo maybe even the name the visual aesthetic and the bit that they overlook and often the bit that isn't working for them is the messaging. What are the words that you are using to be able to communicate what you do to the people that you're trying to reach? And so to your question, Mitch, about what does it look like when it's done well, I think it really comes back to recognizing what your brand is, which is a, a rich, robust, cohesive personality that's representative of who your organization is to all of the different people that you interact with and that you serve and do and having a, a strong understanding of the relative strengths of the different aspects of your brand and so that certainly does include name visual aesthetic but it also includes message message is so important that is quite often where I urge nonprofits to start is look at your messaging. Is it consistent? Is everybody describing what you do in the same way? And is it accurate to what you actually do? Quite often, nonprofits have a message, a story that was written 10 years ago and is out of step with who they're serving today. Yeah. I, I love that you said that because I think it it's it is very similar to what you know Mitch brought up. And that is is that especially if you're a more mature organization and you might've started when, you know, X, Y, Z was a problem and now ABC is the problem. And if you haven't kind of realigned, um, so talk to us a little bit more about that in, in terms of the brand being essential to your mission. Do you find that maybe we don't really know what our mission is or that we haven't backed up in order to get that brand alignment going? Yeah, so I think that there are a few different things to talk about here. And I love, Julia, that you use that word alignment. That alignment is so central when we're thinking about a strong, cohesive brand. So first of all, we want to make sure that our brand is representative of who we are, that it's accurate to what we're doing together, and that it aligns to all the different parts of our uh, of our organization. And what your, your mission is, is absolutely a part of that brand. Quite often, organizations develop a mission statement that is quite um, descriptive of what you do on a day-to-day -day basis. And the best mission statements actually really speak to why you do your work. 
So let's say, for example, there's a nonprofit that works in education. Maybe they have a mission statement that describes, you know, we provide educational advocacy and educational services for our community. That is a description of what you do. But the very best mission statement are really going to get to why. Why do you provide those services? Maybe you provide those services because you believe that every single person should have the opportunity to live their greatest unique life. And that why is far more compelling. And then it really, people connect to that emotionally. And that motivates them to think, oh, I want to know more about what, how you do that. What is it that you do? Yeah, I love that. I think that's, if I, the word I'm thinking of is powerful, right? Mm-hmm. I mean, just the power of the why. Um, I was like all in on your description of this organization when you talked about the why. When you talked about the, you know, the what was going on and the how, it could have been anywhere, anything. It wasn't as um, compelling, right? I mean, what, Mitch, right. what do you see when you think of that as well? Yeah, I was just going to ask. I really like that example. Um, I'm curious, maybe beyond just so one test is, are you describing a what instead of a why, which I really like? Are there other signals that your brand is needs a refresh or reframe? Um, like what are some of the common, most common symptoms that bring people to the brand doctor? <laughs> Yeah. Oh my gosh. I love this question so much. So quite often what people do is they think something isn't working. We are not able to connect with as many clients as we'd like to. We're not attracting the employees that we want to. We're not hitting our fundraising goals. And so this must be a branding issue. If we fix our brand, if people only knew about us, we would not only meet Every single goal, but we would hit it out of the park into the the stars. The thing I hear the most often from nonprofit leaders when we're talking about them needing their services is they quite often say, we are the best kept secret in our community. And it's always a bit of a sign for me because I think, well, I, you know, while branding is important, it is what I do. It is certainly, certainly essential. It is not the fix to every single challenge that you have. And then, so the very first thing to make sure is, is it actually a branding problem that you have? Is it in fact that you, there's there's a mismatch between the service that you're offering and the people that you're trying to reach? Is it that um, there's, that your benefits package is a limitation in trying to attract the employees that you want? Is there something that, uh, that you're, in, is disabling you from reaching the donors that you want to reach? And one, you know, once you've made sure that, okay, everything else is as strong as it cost, can possibly be, then you turn your attention to the brand. And then even then, you know, if you're looking at brand as a holistic thing, you're quite often putting yourself at a disadvantage and you really have to think, okay, let's break down each element of our brand. Where we always start, the most important foundation is what we call your core identity. And your core identity as an organization is, why do you do what you do? What is it that you do? Mm -hmm. How do you do that work? What makes your approach distinct? And then who do you do that work for? Who is the primary beneficiary of the work that you do? Mm -hmm. And having very short, concise answers to those four questions are the building blocks of your brand. And then that has, those building blocks have to run through everything, your message, your visual aesthetic, your logo. And oftentimes we see organizations want to jump into changing any of those things without going to the strong core identity first. And so is, you know, are your donation, not being able to hit your uh, fundraising um, goals, a factor of brand? Probably. Is it about changing your logo? Probably not. Wow. Yeah. Oh my gosh. You're preaching to the choir. Mitch, I see this a lot. It's 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 a sense that if we just change this one thing, the money's gonna fall from the sky. Yeah, I I hear that that it's not a 
a fix all. And I, and I love, even though this is what you do every day that you're able to like distinguish <laughs> when, you know, that is the real problem to be solved. But I will still say like, it, to me, the way that you're describing the approach to brand is like that also it's a rising tide across a lot of problems that you could be having, like getting total alignment on the answers to those four questions are going to help your communications and your fundraising and your donor engagement and your hiring conversation, like everything. So it, while it's, it is not the absolute like panacea fix all it is, it can often, that's like a bedrock, you know, a framework that everything else sits um, within the organization. That is such an incredibly important point. And I feel like I say one of two things all the time and it sounds like they contradict each other, which is brand is everything and brand isn't everything. <laughs> and <laughs> both, both things are true. And I think what I would say is brand built from the bottom up, from that core identity up is everything. Starting from the external visual aspects of your brand is not going to fix everything. And it's making that distinction. Of course, the challenge is we're using that word branding in both things. But I completely agree with you, Mitch, that your brand is not just about external communications and how your organization looks on the internet. It runs through everything. It runs through your management decisions. It runs through your leadership style. It runs through your culture. But it all starts with that core identity. Why do we do what we do? What is it that we do? How do we do this work in a unique way? And who is it that we're serving? And then every single decision from who we hire to what our logo colors are extends from those four things. So, you yeah, know, and I'm sorry, go ahead. Mitch. Sorry, this is, there's no. like so much to get into here. I just wanted to say too, like nonprofits are always stretched for time, right? And like capacity and bandwidth is always limited. The clearer that these items are, think about, I can just think of so many examples. It's like next hiring that you're doing, writing the job description, the time it takes to do that when you're rehashing, what do we do? How do we want to describe it? How do we frame it? Like the incremental social media posts, all of those things, like if you already have your framework that saves so much time, especially from management, you're not having to individually determine those things and reducing those number of decisions is so powerful for capacity building. Sorry. So just needed to say that before. Yeah. No. I think you're right. I think that we spend so much time reinventing the wheel and as opposed to stopping, taking a deep breath, formulating these things, putting them in a central place from, you know, the break room to your website to, you know, the signature lines in your email, whatever that looks like, so that we can all be um, almost like have a culture of repeating the same phraseology, right? so that we're we're saying the same things because Mitch I think you're right we spend so much time worrying about how we're going to start all over from the bottom up as opposed to saying we know what we got to say we know what we got to do here here we have the foundation done i mean Catherine do you see that a lot or 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 is that just part of the the change that we go through Oh, I see that so much. And the best case scenario and the strongest organizations, the strongest cultures make decisions the way exactly the Mitch is describing, where they have a very clear sense of what their core identity is. And they use that as a framework for making decisions. Mm -hmm. What, who do we hire? Who do we promote? What do we, who do we partner with? What do we prioritize in terms of our programs, in terms of our marketing, in terms of our fundraising? And if you think about being a human being, you are a hu an individual human being and you have a personality, you have to make a million decisions every single day. And you don't sit down and think, oh, oh, what am I going to have for dinner? You, you make very quick decisions because you have a core central framework to dictate who you are. And that is what it is, can be like when you have a strong organizational brand. You have a strong, collectively held, consistent brand. Everyone is in the, in the organization, knows who we are, and it makes decision making not easy, but easier, more consistent and more aligned. Mm -hmm. I love that. I think you're absolutely right. And when you phrase it that way, it also makes it very achievable to take that step back, to take that deep breath 
do the heavy lifting up front and then to understand how you're going to uh, navigate it. You know, I, I warned everybody and Mitch and I were kind of joking about this in the green room chatter. This time goes by crazy fast. And so <laughs> we don't have much time left. And Mitch, I know I've sp spoken over you and I know you have even more questions, but let's talk about ARC, authentic, relevant, and consistent. How do we take this recipe for success and, app and apply it to our nonprofits? So strong messaging, strong storytelling is at its strongest when it is this, these three things. And you can apply this to brand as well. When it is authentic, it is a reflection of who you really are as an organization and why you do what you do. And that comes back to that core ID. You have to know those four things. Why do we do what we do? What is it that we do? How do we do this work in a unique way? And who do we do it for? And then make sure that everything you're communicating internally and externally is a reflection of those four things. And then your brand, your communications are more likely to be authentic. Mm -hmm. It has to be relevant. And we haven't really talked about target audience as much. We've really talked about internally and how brand impacts your internal culture. And that is definitely true. But brand, of course, drives your external communications as well. And so it has to be relevant to your target audiences, to the people that you have to reach. And so people get muddled up here because oftentimes they'll make branding decisions in relationship to target audiences and they'll make marketing decisions, which are really more external in relationship to themselves. And so the way to think about this is make sure that your, your core identity is reflective of internally who you are as an organization. What is your essence? And is that captured in your core identity? And then when you're communicating that externally, are you framing it in a way that points to the things that your target audiences care about? And it's that connection between what you care about and what your target audience cares about that will make for really powerful storytelling. And then that last thing is consistent. And if I had to pick one, it would be the consistency. Consistency is king when it comes to branding, when it comes to culture, when it comes to communications. Making sure that you are saying the same thing over and over and over and that it is building from that relevancy, that it is drawing from that authenticity is when your brand, your storytelling, your communications will be the most effective. Love this. So again, not a lot of time left, but one of the things that I would love your opinion on is how much is too much? We keep hearing from folks all the time that are like, I'm afraid that I'm drowning my you know, contact list with information. And so there's this like fear. It's bottom line fear of offending people mm -hmm. or sending out too much or doing too much. What are your thoughts on that? So I think there are two things to think about. In terms of the content of what you're saying and what you're putting out into the world, you need to make sure that these things, that is authentic, is it a true representation of your organization or what you care about? Is it relevant to your target audiences? Don't send them anything that is not relevant to them and will enhance their lives. Sometimes there's some incredible organizational milestone. Maybe you've secured a new donation or you've hit a fundraising goal and we want to shout that from the rooftop. My advice would be shout it from the relevant rooftop. <laughs> tell the people like that. that who who tell the people that that information is going to enhance their lives. Yeah. And then if there's a new program that you've launched or a goal that you've hit that isn't relevant to them, then reserve it from that type of communication. And then be consistent. If you are sending out a consistent email newsletter, find the cadence that works for you. Watch those open rates. If you decrease, does your open rate go up or down? If you increase, does your open rate go up or down? And that sometimes can happen uh, in a way different than you expect. Like I, We've had clients who will increase the number of email newsletters that they're sending and their open rate and their click rate goes up. So yeah. test, test with your target audience and then find a cadence that works for you and, and stick to that consistency. And that's when you'll really be able to build a relationship with the people you're trying to reach. I'm so glad you brought up testing because I think there are people understandably are, are just like we as humans are risk averse in general. Mm -hmm. And so the, the like potential that you, like what you brought up, Julia, we could drown out our message or we could do X, Y, Z. You don't know. You don't know until you've started testing it. And so don't make decisions off of like, 
risks that don't have any data behind them. Um, you know, take make frame good tests, right? And and make decisions where you're gonna have data on the other end to continue improving and evolving, but just not changing things because it could disrupt something. Like how you know, I, I really appreciate you bringing that up around brand in particular. Well, and I'm glad you gave that example because something I hear all the time is people when an idea is floated, someone will say what they would do. Well, that wouldn't work for me. Or I didn't respond to that. Or my nice. friend Janet does this. Or my son, who's the one, the one person I know who's young, told me this. Yes. And, uh, you know, and I always say, but, but you or that person, are they representative of the target audience? And nine times out of ten, the answer is no, they're not. So instead, let's do a test. And we can do control tests. You can do a small test. But seek people who are representative of the people you're trying to reach and see what works for them. Do you want to know who the worst offender of what you just described is, in my experience? Nonprofit yeah. boards. Yes. Oh board my members, God, you're so right. <laughs> board members think that their personal experience is every single person that interacts with the organization. <laughs> yeah. Yes. So you have to come with data, though. And then I think that completely shifts the dynamic of that conversation. Then you're not talking about a personal experience. You're talking about data. Right. Yes. 100%. You know, Mitch, I, I, I'm thrilled that you brought that up. And that's a great way for us to, to end our conversation because that is really a pivotal, I almost want to use the word torpedo to this whole conversation is that when you have this very select group of folks making decisions or, or passing judgment on something when they're not involved in it, um, it's it's crippling and it's it's a tough thing to to deal with and it's also something we need to deal with um at another time uh and get Catherine Alonzo back on to talk about this because it it's a huge huge burden for so many organizations Catherine Alonzo CEO founding partner of Havelina Consulting check out havelina.co and you'll learn more about Catherine, her team, and the work that they do and their approach that they take. Catherine, this has been a lot of fun. I've really enjoyed what you've had to say. It's It's been very achievable. It's been logical. And I think it's been spot on. So thank you so much. Thank you for having me. This has been a blast. It is my favorite topic to talk about. And it's been so fun to geek out about it with you both. Good deal. Yeah, Catherine, I to just reiterate, thank you for those like simple takeaways and next steps people can take and, and really easy frames to follow. This was super approachable. So really appreciative of it. It's been a lot of fun. Hey, Mitch, I'm going to let you lead us out today. How about that, my friend? Love it. Well, uh, thank you to all of our sponsors. If you enjoyed our show today, it's made possible because of all these great folks. Um, we are supported by Bloomerang, the Not American Nonprofit Academy. Nonprofit Thought Leader, Fundraising Academy, 180 Management Group, Part-Time Controller, Staffing Boutique, Inc., JMT Consulting, and Nonprofit Tech Talk. Appreciate all of your support. And from those of us here at the Nonprofit Show, stay well so you can do well. <laughs>